So hi, everyone. I like to be a bit, a bit more on the floor, um, so hence you don't have to use too much of your peripheral vision, so I kind of will be going around the crowd. So um, I'm Dr. Paramal, so I am currently based in Auckland. Um, as mentioned, I have done a, a fellowship in glaucoma, uh, which means that I'm a specialist who has done additional training in performing advanced glaucoma surgery. And there's about 30 of us in New Zealand, and we're all very passionate about speaking to you about glaucoma, so thank you very much for attending today. So I've, I'm here to speak to you about potential or all the different glaucoma surgeries that are currently available. So, before I carry on, I think in this little con uh, discussion about glaucoma surgery, I'm going to be speaking to you about why we do surgery, when, what my patients want to know, and what are the expectations that you and we have in terms of performing glaucoma surgery, how we do it, what is the evidence for, and what are the risks associated with the surgery. So I suppose the most important thing is, as Sonia has already mentioned, Glaucoma is a plumbing problem, and therefore, we have to look a little bit into the physiology of how fluid gets around the eye to talk about how glaucoma surgery uh, works. So fluid is created in the front of the eye, and it drains out to this drainage mechanism of the eye. And when this fails, then the pressure within the eye is increased, and that causes damage on the nerve within the eye. So the way how glaucoma surgery works is essentially by providing a separate pathway for fluid to get out of the eye. So when do we consider doing glaucoma surgery? So we would do it essentially under three criteria. So firstly, when we fail to achieve the target pressure. Secondly, when there's poor tolerance of the medication. And thirdly, due to non-compliance. So what does that actually mean? So this is really important to understand that there is a concept of target pressure. So every time you come to see us as your specialist, we are thinking about what is that magic pressure which will reduce your glaucoma progression sufficiently. And everyone has an individual target pressure. And that is very much personalized to your eye. We talk about non-tolerance, and Sonia's talked about that, how a lot of patients develop allergies to medications, either to the preservatives or due to the systemic side effects of these drops. And finally, despite best efforts, we know that patients do find it hard to use medications every day. So what are the expectations? So when I talk about surgery, I do not take that as a minor conversation. I put aside half an hour to talk to my patients about surgical options. During this consultation, it really is a partnership. I can do the surgery, but a lot of the work is really going to be done by yourself after you leave the operation theatre. So I talk about what's involved with the surgery. So the first thing, contrary to belief, we do not remove the eyeball when we do the surgery. <laughs> okay, fear. <laughs> the operation is actually done in theatre. It's a day procedure. What that means is you come in during the day, you have the surgery, and you get to go home. Now, most of the operations are done under local anesthetic. However, if you're anxious or you find it very difficult to stay still for the duration of the surgery, then we would consider a procedure under general anesthetic. Now, we do the operation as a team, and this is what it looks like in surgery. A patient's lying on a bed. When you are doing the operation on local anesthetic, you're literally by me. So if there's any concerns, you can tell me. You can put your hand up as long as it doesn't touch your face. I will stop and listen to you. And likewise, it's actually a communication. And, and some people actually find it quite an enjoyable experience because I'm telling you what's happening. That is provided you wanted me, want me to speak about it. Now, what happens when you do leave? Now, glasses. You do expect your prescription to change when you have had uh, glaucoma surgery because as your pressure changes, you expect your prescription to change. And I usually tell my patients that it can sometimes take up to three months for the prescription to stabilize. You will be taking drops, and sometimes that can be up to about three months of taking um, steroid eye drops because one of the biggest reasons why our surgery fails is because there is too much inflammation and too much scar tissue. Finally, it's really important to attend follow-ups. Now, whilst most of the operation itself in, is occurring in surgery, but a lot of these fine tunings actually occurs 
outside in clinic. And what that involves is essentially after we've done the operation, we may be manipulating the eye slightly. Sometimes we are massaging the eye, that means putting extra pressure in the eye. Sometimes we're taking sutures out, and other times we're giving little injections or anti-scarring agents. So it's really important to attend this follow-ups and just be, a, be aware of the spine tunings. Now, having said that, Glaucoma surgery, because there's so many different surgeries, they can range from 10 minutes to an hour and a half. So some of these procedures, why they take 10 minutes, they might, that entails 10% of the work is actually in, done in theatre and 90% of the work is actually done in clinic. So it's really crucial that a lot of these things that I'm talking about is going to be in context for your surgery. Finally, what do you do about driving? Now, driving is very much on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have less of an invasive procedure, then most likely you can go back to driving fairly soon, and that could be within two weeks. But in some surgeries, such as trabeculectomy, where there's a lot more um, variability in your results, particularly in the first six weeks, I tell my patients to allow at least six weeks before you can go back to driving. But that's pretty much a case-by-case -case basis. Now, a lot of my patients love gardening, and gardening does actually involve a lot of heavy lifting and bending over, and that may not be advisable in some of our patients for at least about six weeks. So pretty much as a case-by-case -case basis, you know, and you have to speak to your surgeon if your surgeon doesn't tell you otherwise during each consultation where, what your suitability to do these activities are. So how do I decide on what surgery I'm going to go through? to have performed to a patient. Now, it's actually a very complex um, uh, question to answer, but if you look at patient factors, I take into consideration patient expectations, if they're going to be doing any traveling, what their hobbies are, and also how suitable they are for, for medical reasons to have the surgery performed. I also have to consider the fact of whether they have cataracts. Now, if you have cataracts, now sometimes to save you from having to do two surgeries, we may do a glaucoma procedure in combination to the cataract surgery. Availability is a really important concept. Not every surgery is currently available in New Zealand, and there are unfortunately going to be some variation within public versus private and also across DHBs. As I've mentioned, there's only 30 of us who are particularly trained in doing advanced glaucoma surgery, and that's not going to be available to everyone in the country. And most importantly, we also have to look at the glaucoma type and whether things are progressing. So I'll come across to the other side now. So when we think about how we do glaucoma surgery, we have to look at a couple of different factors. So when we look at glaucoma itself, and this is essentially looking at what my clinic has made up of patients with glaucoma, most of the patients are in the green zone. So they have ocular hypertension, which is where you don't have glaucoma, but that's a risk factor, very strong risk factor for developing glaucoma, or they have mild glaucoma. And in that situation, then we would consider doing minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And I'll come into that concept very shortly. Now, a smaller proportion of patients who have moderate to severe glaucoma end up having to have more of the traditional glaucoma surgery, which is called filtration surgery and drainage tube surgery. And some patients, they need cyclodiode, and in other patients, they may need these procedures, which are called Zen, Microplus, and InFocus. And an asterisk here is what's available in Auckland. Okay, so this is where it gets um, a little bit more exciting. So I'm going to put you through animation, uh, show you videos of animations of what the different surgeries are. And the most common um, surgeries that we have include filtration surgery, drainage tubes, eye stents, zens, and cyclodiode. And on the left-hand side are pictures of what um, my patient's eyes look like, uh, typically after they've had glaucoma surgery, but particularly around three to six uh, months' time. So the first operation is called trabeculectomy or deep sclerectomy. Um, and in this procedure, what we do is we create a channel uh, for the fluid to drain out of the eye. Okay, the animation is... There you go, okay. So in this um, system, what we do is we create a separate channel for fluid to drain out of the eye, and what that does is it creates this little blister of fluid here on the surface of the eye. 
Now, that blister is not very noticeable to most people. But what you'll notice here, on this photo here, can you see that little gentle elevation there? That's where the fluid's actually getting out of the eye. So this is trabeculectomy, and we have been doing this for over 50 years. So it's a procedure which we all know how to do fairly well. We know what the complications are. This procedure usually takes about 45 minutes to 60 minutes to perform. Now, the downside of this is that whilst on the table we know what the flow and how the eye looks like, but when you come back to clinic, we have to do a lot of that fine tuning. So typically I would see the patient on a weekly basis for the first six weeks because sometimes the pressure could be very low, as, as we mentioned, um, as our patient mentioned earlier, the pressure could be too low and then you have to pump the eye up. And sometimes the pressure could be quite high, and so that's where you have to massage the eye or you have to take sutures out. So the next procedure I'm going to talk about is glaucoma drainage tubes. Now, this is a procedure which is usually done in patients who are fairly refractory to glaucoma treatment. So you can see in this photo here, this is a patient who's actually had several trabeculectomies and unfortunately it's failed, and so we have had to do a drainage tube. So in this procedure, a special silicon tube is inserted in the front of the eye and the fluid drains through that silicon tube onto a surface plate. Now that plate has been anchored on the surface of the eye and has been sutured. Now, once again, you have this little dome-shaped elevation of fluid on the surface of the eye. Now, this procedure is usually done at general anesthetic. It takes about an hour and a half, and we would only do this in someone who has quite refractory glaucoma, which has done poorly, or we suspect would do poorly with the classic filtration surgery. As you can see, these operations are not very simple procedures to do. It is fairly invasive because there's tissue dissections. We're placing um, you know, a foreign object uh, on the surface of the eye. And therefore, in the last five to 10 years, the whole, a lot of our research has actually gone into creating minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So you'll come across this concept more and more. And they're also called MIGS, M-I-G-S. The idea behind MIGS uh, literature and research is essentially trying to find surgeries which are safer and less invasive and more reproducible. And, and the whole essence is so that you have a faster recovery. So the one which is the most commonly performed is called the eye stent. Now, this is very similar in concept to uh, having a stent when you have cardiac surgery. And what we have here is a small little stent. It's made from titanium, less than a third of a micron in size. And during, usually during, in conjunction with cataract surgery, we inject uh, the stent into the drainage of the eye. And that allows an alternative pathway for the fluid to drain out of the eye. Now, the success of this it is as good as one, if not two, glaucoma medications. So those are the patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, and it also is associated with a 30% reduction in intraocular pressure. So it's not suitable for everyone, but if you are in that right uh, subgroup of patients who has intolerance to medications or is having cataract surgery, it is something that you should consider. The downside is... A, it's not going to be good for advanced glaucoma because it's not going to bring your pressure down as equivalent to three or four medications. And secondly, it's the cost implication. The implant itself is $2,000. Now, moving on to Zen implants. Now, this, on the other hand, is actually performed for patients with advanced glaucoma. And in this procedure, a small, which is about six millimeter gelatin stent is inserted through the wall of the eye and allows fluid to drain out through a separate pathway. And very similar to the filtration surgery, it forms a little fluid full blab on the surface of the eye. As you can see here, the eye itself actually looks quite, well, like an ordinary eye. So, and this is our goal of being a glaucoma surgeon. We want the eye to look as though we haven't done surgery because that's how an eye should look like. Now, oh, before I forget, one of the biggest advantages with a Zen implant is that it takes 10 minutes to perform. So I've got a lot of patients who are not safe for general anaesthetic, but cannot stay still for 45 to 60 minutes. So at least the Zen has a potential in these patients because it is a 10 minute procedure, but there is still a lot of um, intensive post-operative follow-up. I tend to see the patients usually once again on a weekly basis for the first six weeks, and in some other patients I might be able to save them an additional one or two visits. 
So this is called cyclodiet, and the laser is applied on the surface of the eye. The laser basically targets the ciliary body, which processes fluid, and so this is equivalent to switching off the tap. Now, cyclodiode, the only issue is that it could over-treat the eye, and so the pressure goes too low. And you can, as you've already heard from Estelle, sometimes if the pressure is too low, that's almost a bit more dangerous. So it's always a little bit of a fine balance as to whether we are going to get the pressure low enough, and essentially, uh, when it gets too low, what uh, essentially we'll have to deal with potential complications there. And this picture, this is actually a little child. So there are babies who are born with congenital glaucoma, and this procedure is also performed in these little babies. Okay, so is there evidence for, the, uh, for what we do? Yes. There's a lot of evidence for glaucoma surgery. And if you look at PubMed, which is basically a database of all the research articles, and it basically is our go-to as clinicians, scientists, to decide on what, how to look after the patients, our patients, we have over 23,000 papers on looking at glaucoma surgery. Finally, what are the risks of glaucoma surgery? Now, I've only highlighted the risk of trabeculectomy surgery because that is your traditional conventional surgery. Now, I think it's really important that you have to put risk in context of the situation. We would only offer, uh, offer surgery to you if the risk of surgery is significantly less than going blind. Now, 20% of patients will require fine tuning, and that's what I was talking about, being in clinic, having those little manipulations. 20% of patients will have blurred vision, but most of that will be corrected by an updated prescription. 20% of patients who hasn't had cataracts will develop cataracts and require cataract surgery within five to 10 years of having glaucoma surgery. Less than one in 100% uh, of, uh, 100 of patients would have severe infection, inflammation, and bleeding, and less than one in 1,000 will have permanent loss of vision. And lastly, even when we have done your surgery, it's crucial to know that we still have to follow you up because you will have some degree of loss of control. And in this situation, uh, the quote at risk is 50% of patients five years following uh, traditional trabeculectomy surgery will require some sort of manipulation. And that's actually called, um, in our words, failure. And the fact is, if there is failure, if there's loss of control, we'll either put you back on drops or we might consider doing more surgery. Now, <clears throat> I hope that that's been quite useful to you, and I know I've only given you a little bit of information about glaucoma surgery. If you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch with us, and more than anything, this is a partnership that we have with you, so I think it's really important that, that you're aware that glaucoma specialists love speaking about glaucoma, we love talking about you, so make sure that you certainly um, let us know if you have any concerns. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.